Today we are here in Gitagan Mishkiki at Shingwa Kinamagagamik to learn from the inspiring collection of indigenous stories here on Spotlight Features, honoring and healing. In the spirit of truth, respect, and understanding, we honor and acknowledge that we are filming in Robinson Huron Treaty Territory, and the land that which we are gathered is the traditional territory of the Métis peoples, as well as the Anishinaabek, specifically Garden River and Batchewana First Nations. Waje, Boju, Misko and Nimki Benesi Kwan Dishnakaz, Gitigan Zibi and Dunjiba, Minwa Iu Ishji and Dunjiba, Ajajak and Dodem. Hello and welcome. My spirit name is Red Thunderbird Woman. My mother, Joanne Pine Ba, is Ojibwe from Garden River First Nation, and my father, Les Ludit, is Cree from East Main Iu Ishji. I am the great great granddaughter of Chief Shinwakons. Today we are on the grounds of Algoma University and the site of the Shingwak Indian Residential School where my father attended as a young child for many years. As an intergenerational survivor, the process of decolonization has no doubt been very hard. Today, we share powerful stories of resilience so that Canadians may have a better understanding of truth before we can achieve reconciliation. Residential schools were built in partnership with the Canadian government and the Anglican Church. The school itself was meant to be, for lack of better terms, reduce the amount of Indigenous culture within the Indigenous people and to assimilate them to this culture that they were growing here in Canada. As Indigenous people, we uh, have thrived through the, you know, the, the most of what any people probably have gone through in history. This is what was placed as a memorial for those grave sites essentially that were unmarked. One of the kind of misnomers is that they think that 215 people were found, but that's not actually the case. It was 215 unmarked graves were found, so multiple people could have actually been within those graves. We're in the thousands now, but at that time there was 215. It's impacted us personally with my children's grandparents going to residential schools, seeing how it affected them and their, their children who are you know, the father and you know, relatives of my own children and seeing the impacts that they're having. We consider this intergenerational trauma. So this is all trauma that, that gets passed down from one generation to the next. Studies are, are coming out that talk about this intergenerational trauma, not necessarily do you have to actually be the one that's being traumatized on your yourself, but if it's coming from your parents and you're looking towards the, the trauma, it kind of goes, goes into that. It's really something that has been on my mind for 15 years, essentially. This is our history here, and it was a genocide. They, they were taking these children to do genocide. We don't steer clear from the truth, and that's one of the main things, is that we're always honest in that way. We're always uh, staying towards that real truth of, of, of our people and of the area. My mother has always been encouraging me to, to follow that path of, of learning our ways because she made a big decision to get together with a, a man who was clearly Indigenous, who at the time didn't acknowledge those things because of he'd been brought uh, and, and raised by non-Indigenous people in the, probably the worst ways. His identity has been sort of uh, to a point where, you know, he didn't feel all that comfortable with, with who he was. I wasn't raised in a great situation and when I had children I just wanted to do the best possible thing I could do and learn everything about being a good parent and you know read every book that I could get my hands on. 
so that I could make a difference in my own children's life. We have three canoes. Oh yeah. And we're getting Again. in and out of all different lakes. Wait, he's grabbing the stick. He's trying to hit me. Oh no. Oh, we gotta make sure not to hurt him, okay? Okay. I see also um, with my children's struggles that getting back to culture for them is really healing. Our youngest is struggling a little bit and he is asking for smudge when he's not feeling good and you know he's really excited to come to powwows with us and he is now wanting to make his own regalia and he, it's, it's lighting him up and it's giving him a purpose as well and feeling connected with his own roots. I'm sharing a piece of our history, of our culture, of our people because those, those songs have been here since time immemorial. It's not about just doing something for the sake of doing it. It's doing something to honor our people that have come before us and, and our ancestors and it's to honor our future generations. So why is it called the grandfather drum? It's given to the, uh, to the Menda to help them bond, right? To, to not fight amongst each other. Right, right, so right. the grandfather just so we don't put anything on it, we don't, we don't leave it out in the open or anything. We, we respect it like we would our grandfather. My father, it's, he never really got a chance to grow up in a situation where he could do that openly. So now that I can do it openly, I, I take all those opportunities to do it because he says to me, these I couldn't do when I was growing up and all the things that you're doing, I, I couldn't do without retribution or without, uh, you know, oppression. And now get all the information you can and, and be as proud as you, you can and, and I'm proud about what you're doing and you have to do this for our people. People want to learn about Indigenous uh, culture and history, the real history, especially after finding the 215 graves uh, in Kamloops, it opened a lot of people's eyes. So. To me, it's a natural thing to be working towards doing this reconciliation work. Whether they're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, the whole idea is this, is be proud of what you are and to be understanding of our situation as Indigenous people here on Turtle Island. We now take you to Tekemloops, meaning where the two rivers meet, and known today as Kamloops, where Aboriginal educator Rachelle Bennett shares her personal story related to missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit people. She focuses on educating young Indigenous people on the diverse methods of healing that are accessible for those who are interested. Her powerful message inspires hope for a brighter future for Indigenous people and for all nations. The life that I had to live after my mother's body was found. I'm not going to lie, it was really hard. The inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls has now issued its final report. To read this inquiry, it made me realize she was more likely to be murdered and go missing. It really breaks my heart. Some 1,200 Indigenous women and girls have been murdered or gone missing since 1980, according to the National Inquiry's final report. The frequent and widespread disappearance and murder of Indigenous girls and women amounts to Canadian genocide. Response to Ray Bennett. Thank you for speaking with our class. I myself am Indigenous. I'm also dealing with the loss of a loved one, so hopefully your ways of healing can inspire me to find my own path to recovery. To hear that kind of response from young people, it really moved my heart. I never realized the impact I made on these young souls. They were so elated that I could come in and talk about 
my authentic story rather than talking about the statistics they said it gave them a sense of what a lot of us are going through and it had such a profound impact on them. On September 1st, 1997 was the day we found out my mother first went missing and her body wasn't found until August 4th, 1999 just the day before my birthday. It feels like a piece of my heart died when I found out um, she was taken. I basically just shut down for a good while. The pain that I've endured as an Indigenous woman has impacted the community in such a way that I feel my pain is, is your pain. I understand that I'm not alone. And when I started to educate myself more, it made me realize how my mom went to residential school and how she never got any healing. And then I realized that thousands upon thousands never got counseling or healing of any kind. And it came to this point in my life, I have nothing but unconditional love for her. And understanding. I have a huge understanding of my mother now. So when I go into schools, I bring my mama with me. I, I bring her picture and sometimes the stories will be a little bit different, but the main message is always there. I would love for students to know that they're not limited. We inspire them to create their own movement, find their own medicine. They love that part of my story. They were mystified by all the cool healing modalities I experienced. There's so much out in this world that I just wanted to experience life. I just wanted to be joy, and I want students to know there is peace and they can be joy. That we can choose the path of healing, or we can choose the path of destruction. I chose the path of healing as one. Preserving our cultures, languages, and traditions are a form of healing for many, just like in this next story, where one man's healing journey begins with the practicing and sharing of traditional art.
We now move to Baoting, meaning the place of the rapids, and known today as Sault Ste. Marie, where we meet a two-spirited indigenous drag performer who is educating audiences on the history of the native LGBTQ plus community pre-colonization. I feel this energy in the room every time I'm on stage. When I'm out of drag, Jordan is just this boring businessman in a suit who works for the government. And when I transform into Bebe Lala, it's a whole different person. I have this confidence to be able to speak, to be able to inspire youth and other people to find their queer identity or find their indigenous identity. Two-spirit people are known in the Indigenous community as the carriers or keepers of culture and story. And with a male and female spirit, they're able to take both and share that with our community and pass on that knowledge through generations. And it, it doesn't matter if they're biologically a male or biologically a female because that two-spirit identity, our culture has recognized it for thousands of years. The Catholic Church had told people that it was not okay to be gay, and when they stripped the people at the residential schools away of their indigenous culture, they didn't just take away the fact that we are First Nations people. They took away much more than that. They took away the right to be able to be a two-spirit person and told our people that that was not okay. When my parents divorced, my mother wanted nothing to do with my father's side of the family, which in turn stripped me of being able to know who I was. When I was put into the Indigenous culture class, and my mother found out, and uh, all I remember is being taken out of that class on my first day and being just hurt at the fact, feeling like I wasn't Native enough or wasn't accepted in that space, and that definitely set the pace for the next 10, 15 years of my life. My grandmother never really talked about her time at the residential schools to the grandkids or her kids, but my father, he's an alcoholic. He has been sober and clean for a while now, but I know a lot of the suffering that he went through is his to carry, but I lost my brother two years ago to a car accident that involved drugs. He was severely intoxicated, um, way over the legal limit in drinking. And he was my number one supporter in my drag career. And really, him and I together wanted to find our heritage and our culture. And we really wanted to embrace being Indigenous together. And he understood that drag was my outlet to be able to express myself and to tell my stories. And he was the only person in my family that knew I did drag for the longest time, and uh, he never got to see me perform. You can't help but wonder if it would be different if my grandmother never got sent to Shingwalk Residential School or Pelican Falls Residential School. I chose to get sober because I wanted to be able to overcome that cycle of abuse and generational trauma. I know it would have made a big difference in my life if I would have been able to see a queer indigenous person while I was struggling. Having that sort of mentor or someone to look up to would have made a huge difference for me. And I don't want anyone to have to feel the pains that I felt. And it is my responsibility to learn more about our culture and the teachings and knowledge and then be able to go on 
and pass that down generations so it continues to live on. And I think a part of reconciliation is bringing back the pieces of our identities that were taken from us. Next, we have Jarek Williams, an Indigenous cultural educator and Coast Salish food chef who shares his love of the culinary arts through his traditional ways of harvesting and preparing salmon. I'm Jared Williams. I am a cultural educator. My family has been fishing here for generations. I'd say a hundred, maybe two hundred generations. There are archaeological sites here on this river that actually like show the inhabitation um, for over like two like thousand years here on this alone. When the Europeans arrived here, 18, like 60s, there were over 20,000 individuals actually just up the river here at one of our largest villages. But yeah, so this is my spear. Our traditional word for it is sunnam. Uh, this one is handcrafted. This is a uh, fir tree. The lines and the rods on the end here are all new. So in yesteryear, that would all be wood and handcrafted line. So let's have a look at exactly how this thing works. So if it's all the way down there and you see it on its way up, here's the fish coming up. Get ready, pull back, throw, hit, and then retrieve. You know, when I was young, there were hundreds in here. And now we only see one or, you know, you know that's it, <laughs> all day. It's a lot of change in uh, one lifetime. Okay, so we didn't actually land anything today, but I knew that was a chance. So I'm ready with a fish, <laughs> a sockeye. Now these aren't usually here with us, but they are a very nice. So here we go, the way the ancestors used to do it. So right underneath the front gill, into the head, ring the tail, flip it over, do it again, behind the fin, to the head. Draw a line down the back. Come up, find the spine bone. And then I follow the ribs and the spine, and just like that, come apart. To the inside, flip it over, do the same thing. Whenever we cook fish, we have to have the right wood. All the elders will get mad if you use the wrong wood. Believe me, I know. So this is dried maple wood. And it's really all they want us to use. So let's light the fire here. Already got it a little warmed up. Put some more wood on there and get it hot. So these are called tats. And they slide into the fish to hold it wide open just like that hey thank you so much for like joining us here today i have to admit all i had to do was uh rest here by the river try to catch a fish and uh prepare it you know the way my ancestors did for generations so hey hey oh hi tap next we visit the Asokoan friendship center where we hear the first-hand experience of an intergenerational survivor. To me, a residential school survivor is somebody that has survived and is living 
with what they've experienced through the residential schools. My name is Kirby Bigchild. I'm the executive director here at the Asokwin Friendship Centre, also known as the Rocky Native Friendship Centre. I went to two different residential schools in Saskatchewan. My first residential school was St. Michael's Residential School in Duck Lake, Saskatchewan. I also went to Fort Capel Indian Residential School in Fort Capel, Saskatchewan. Residential schools were finished in 1996, so I attended in the last few years. I, I believe I, I didn't have a father because of residential schools. I think he had, a, he had great hardships that he was going through. Maybe he stayed away because he knew he wasn't mentally stable or emotionally stable and able to pass on love and guidance and leadership. Truth and reconciliation. Truth means is bringing out the truth, exactly what it what it says, and it's, it means sharing the truth of of what Indigenous peoples went through in the past and in our history. Reconciliation is is taking action on how to address it, how to share it. And so it steps it steps needing needed to take to honor our history and make amends to it. Putting on an orange shirt means acknowledging our history, acknowledging our past, acknowledging the hardships our children went through. It means having that respect and honor enough to wear an orange shirt and representing yourself, uh, your family. Wearing an orange shirt means that you're, you have an understanding of, of what the history is and honoring it and, and respecting it. I live my life today uh, for, my, for my children, for my family, living by example, showing my children how to lead a good life and, and make, make a positive impact in, our, in their lives, in their, their circles. Gitchamigwetch, thank you so much for joining today. At this time, I would like to acknowledge the families of the children who never made it home, for those who are grieving, and for the communities who are currently in the process of searching for their loved ones. Our hearts are with you. If you would like to see more Indigenous stories, follow Shaw Spotlight on social media or check out shawspotlight.ca. This is what was placed as a memorial for those grave sites, essentially, they were unmarked. The life that I had to live after my mother was found. I'm not gonna lie, it was really hard. I want all Indigenous 2SLGBTQ people to feel like they are safe and they are welcome. Maybe he stayed away because he knew he wasn't mentally stable. <laughs>